Welcome to the Women's Memorial Hermann at Memorial City Bonding with Your Newborn informational webinar. Today's presentation will focus on techniques that promote bonding between parents and baby, as well as the benefits of skin-to-skin -skin contact and breastfeeding. Topics include preparation for breastfeeding, what you should expect once you arrive at the hospital and after your delivery, and information to help support successful breastfeeding. There will be an interactive Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Our speakers today are staff physicians at Women's Memorial Hermann at Memorial City. Dr. Amanda Brack is a board certified pediatrician who has helped many families navigate the newborn period and work towards successful breastfeeding. Dr. Krista Tamol is an obstetrician gynecologist who routinely counsels her patients regarding the postpartum period and the decision to breastfeed. We will begin with an overview of issues in, that patients are encouraged to consider prior to delivery. Dr. Tamel, what topics do you routinely discuss with patients during prenatal care? Many of my patients have questions about the postpartum hospital stay and the decision to breastfeed. I encourage pregnant mothers and their partners to have a general idea about what they plan to do with regard to infant feeding prior to their due date. Breastfeeding is natural, but it is also a learned skill both for the mother and for the infant. It is not uncommon to encounter breastfeeding challenges. Prior to delivery, parents should obtain a reasonable level of comfort with breastfeeding information. Without this preparation, postpartum fatigue may contribute to information overload. In addition, unreasonable expectations regarding breastfeeding may lead to avoidable frustration with the process. La Leche League is a popular resource for patients who want more information about breastfeeding. Dr. Brack, what are some of the benefits of breastfeeding? Breastfeeding has many benefits for the infant and the mother. It is a unique way to bond with your baby. Breastfeeding helps to decrease postpartum bleeding and to lose baby weight. In addition, women who have breastfed their children have a decreased risk of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and diabetes. In addition, breastfed infants have more stable heart rates, respiratory rates, and oxygenation. Breast milk is also a steady source of antibodies that are crucial during that newborn period. Furthermore, breastfeeding your newborn decreases his or her odds of having ear infections, asthma, diabetes, childhood leukemia, and sudden infant death syndrome. The Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative is a global program sponsored by the World Health Organization and UNICEF. The program recognizes hospitals and birthing centers that offer an optimal level of care for feeding infant feeding. In addition to making breastfeeding a viable option for new mothers, Baby Friendly Care also provides in-room newborn care and avoids the need to separate parents from their newborns. This promotes bonding, improves feeding and weight gain for healthier babies, and allows for better sleep for both mother and child. Women's Memorial Hermann at Memorial City has in-house obstetrician gynecologist and neonatologist at all times. After delivery, your baby will be transitioned from birth to the newborn period by a transition team. We'll talk more about that later. In most cases, your baby will room in with you, and you and your baby will receive nursing care as a couplet. Lactation consultants will assist with breastfeeding, and breast pumps and accessories are available on site for purchase. Our support to new families continues after you have left the hospital through the outpatient services we provide. The length of your hospital stay is determined in part by how you deliver your baby. In general, patients who have a vaginal delivery stay for two nights, and patients who have a C-section stay for three nights. After delivery, most babies are placed skin to skin with the mother. If the mom chooses to breastfeed, her nurse will help her with the first latch, ideally during the first hour after delivery. For those patients who deliver via cesarean, the first breastfeeding may occur after surgery in the recovery room. Both mom and baby are monitored after delivery on the labor floor, and then they are brought to their postpartum room together. The infant will generally have his or her first bath in the room once the transition period is complete. 
The hour immediately after delivery is often referred to as the golden hour. It is called the golden hour because for about that time period, your newborn will be alert and awake and ready to experience a lot of firsts with you. The first time for breastfeeding, the first time for skin to skin, and the first time for bonding overall. If possible, it is great to spend this hour after delivery holding and feeding your baby before he or she becomes tired and needs to rest. And for these reasons, we do everything we can to keep the two of you together during that precious hour. You will also hear the word transition used often in the newborn period. And what we are referring to is the time period, usually three to six hours after delivering, that your baby is adjusting to the world outside of the womb. During this period, your baby is breathing on his own for the first time and experiencing cardiovascular changes to make life outside the womb possible, as well as regulating temperature. As healthcare providers, we are more vigilant during this time monitoring closely the physical exam and vital signs to assure that this intricate process goes as smoothly as possible. After delivery, babies are placed skin to skin with the mother, meaning that the baby has on only a diaper and is otherwise against the mother's skin under her gown. Dads can also participate by holding this infant skin to skin. This close contact with a parent is a wonderful way to help newborns regulate body temperature. Latch describes the way the infant takes the breast and transfers milk from the breast into the mouth. The infant's mouth should be wide open with lips flanged outward. This may be described as fish lips. The infant's mouth should encompass the nipple and a significant part of the areola. Colostrum is a relatively denser breast milk produced in the first few days after delivery. It is rich in protein and antibodies. Mature milk appears around 10 days postpartum. Many women worry that breastfeeding will hurt. Early mild discomfort is common among breastfeeding women. Nipple pain beyond soreness or discomfort and beyond the beginning of a nursing episode may be an indication of suboptimal breastfeeding technique. Limiting the time at each breastfeeding has little effect on nipple soreness, but correct latch and positioning are crucial. We are here to help mothers figure out what is most comfortable for them. Hospital personnel are available to show mothers how to breastfeed. We can help patients who have a cesarean delivery find a comfortable position for holding the baby to nurse. Lactation consultants will show new mothers how to initiate and maintain lactation even if they should be separated from their infants. Mothers who plan to express their breast milk may bring their breast pump and accessories with them, but these products are also available for purchase from the hospital. In addition, all of the private rooms in our Level 3 neonatal intensive care unit have breast pumps and refrigerators to store the expressed breast milk. Many parents are concerned that their babies are not receiving enough milk through exclusive breastfeeding. In fact, that is the most common reason why women stop breastfeeding, either in the hospital or after discharge, is because of perceived inadequacy of their milk supply. One of the best ways to measure intake is through the newborn's voiding and stooling patterns, their activity level, and also watching the baby's color to ensure that he or she isn't too jaundiced most newborns will void only one time within the first 24 hours, but the urine output should rapidly pick up within the next three days. Also, the color and consistency of the stools will change within the first couple of days. If you do not see weight gain and or a rapid increase in bowel movements and urine output, we suggest you contact your pediatrician. Nearly all infants lose weight for the first two to four days after birth, which can be very distressing for parents. You can, however, expect that your newborn should return to their birth weight within 7 to 14 days. Most mothers can produce an adequate supply of milk, and most infants can nurse effectively and consume an adequate volume during this time. If supplementation does become medically necessary, breastfeeding should continue with the addition of formula only after a baby has nursed. Remember, any amount of nursing is valuable and beneficial to you and your newborn. 
Where there is no demand, there is no supply. Delays in the arrival of the full milk supply are usually the product of interventions that decrease the frequency of suckling. This includes the use of supplementation and pacifiers. Frequent suckling allows the full milk supply to develop as soon as possible, usually in two to five days after delivery. Milk expression techniques, for example, using a breast pump, can also be used to increase your milk production. We encourage breastfeeding newborns on demand. Infants should be put to the breast whenever they exhibit signs of hunger. Infant cues such as hand-to-mouth activity, smacking lips, rooting, eye movements in light sleep, and cooing sounds, as well as movements of the extremities are early signs of hunger. Infant crying is actually a late sign of hunger. A crying infant may be difficult to calm and latch to the breast, so we recommend feeding your infant when he or she exhibits early signs of hunger. The strategy of allowing a baby to cry it out is very familiar to sleep-deprived parents. However, this concept does not apply to newborns. Babies expend precious energy when they cry. An infant who has been crying for some time may become exhausted and go to sleep without nursing or before finishing an entire feeding. We want infants to instead put their energy toward breastfeeding, which also takes much of their strength. Frequent feeding will help diminish crying episodes. Breastfeeding should start when the infant is quiet and alert. Efforts should be made to minimize crying. Human milk empties the stomach faster than formula. Breastfeeding mothers should understand that, for this reason, their infants may nurse more frequently than formula-fed infants take a bottle. Frequent breastfeeding is normal. It is not a sign of inadequate milk supply. Expected breastfeeding routines vary widely, and it is important for both parents to be familiar with the range of frequency with which the infant may need to nurse. Typically, newborns will nurse 8 to 12 times or more in 24 hours, for around 10 to 15 minutes per breast. Breastfeeding should occur every one and a half to three hours, where the interval between feedings is calculated from the beginning of one nursing session to the beginning of the next. Mothers should nurse at each breast at each feeding, starting with the breasts offered last at the prior feeding and this will help to achieve an optimal milk supply in both breasts. Milk should come in between days two to five after delivery, and by day five, mothers should notice the presence of milk, and their breasts may be firm or leaking. Audible swallowing indicates milk transfer to the infant. Swallowing may be difficult to hear when the newborn is taking the small sips of colostrum in the first few days, but as your milk volume increases, swallowing should be heard easily. And again, the best way to monitor your newborn's intake is to monitor the stools and voids. Signs of satiety include longer pauses between suckling bursts, the infant taking himself off the breast, disappearance of the hunger cues, relaxed posture, and sleep. Having said this, it is common for infants to fall asleep at the breast prematurely before a good feeding has finished. In this case, efforts should be made to wake and relatch. A cold washcloth on the forehead, tickling the feet, and changing the diaper in between breasts can all help your sleepy infant eat well at each feeding. The mother's partner and other family members play an important role in her postpartum recovery and the lactation process. Breastfeeding support includes assistance with infant positioning, evaluation of the infant's latch, and monitoring for infant swallowing. When mothers go home from the hospital, they should be relieved of household chores and of care for other children so that they may fully recovery, recover from the delivery process. Mothers are strongly encouraged to sleep while the baby sleeps. Failure to do so oftentimes results in poor establishment of a milk supply and to greater susceptibility to the impact of postpartum blues. Next, we'd like to cover a few commonly asked questions that we receive in clinic. 
The first question is with regard to whether or not a patient should be able to breastfeed if her nipples are flat or inverted. The short answer to this is yes. Usually what we will try for a patient is uh, to assist her with the use of nipple shields, which are made of latex or silicone, and they may be used to help the infant latch onto a flat or inverted nipple. We also use them to help in situations of engorged breasts uh, for patients who have sore nipples or when we're trying to transition a premature infant from tube feeding to breastfeeding. The lactation consultants at the hospital should be able to advise you on whether a nipple shield may be helpful for you. The next question is in regard to breast engorgement. What can I do to avoid or alleviate the pain from breast engorgement? Breast engorgement is caused by inefficient or absent draining of the breasts. It usually occurs three to seven days postpartum. It is caused by inefficient or absent draining of the breasts and may occur later as the result of delayed or missed feedings. Frequent breastfeeding and pumping can help to avoid and treat painful engorgement. Warm compresses or a warm shower can facilitate milk removal and cold compresses may decrease pain and swelling. However, keeping your breasts softened during this time period will make latching much easier for you and your infant. So to avoid engorgement is good. Another question I sometimes receive um, from women who are planning to breastfeed is um, questions about what they need to do prior to uh, delivery. So sometimes people want to know, well, should I start pumping prior to delivery to increase my milk supply? And the answer is no. We discourage pumping or nipple stimulation prior to delivery. Stretching or rolling the nipples or trying to use a breast pump during pregnancy may result in the release of something called oxytocin. And that may stimulate uterine contractions and potentially lead to preterm labor. So we really recommend that you not try to do anything with regard to um, having your milk supply come in prior to your delivery. Breastfeeding is painful for me. Am I doing something wrong? Early mild nipple discomfort is common among breastfeeding women. However, nipple pain beyond the soreness or discomfort beyond the beginning of a nursing episode may be the indication of suboptimal breastfeeding technique. As we stated earlier, correct latch and positioning are crucial to decrease your pain. If you are still experiencing pain one to two weeks out, we highly encourage you to contact your physician or speak to an outpatient lactation consultant to adjust and optimize your latching techniques. There are also are a lot of patients who have questions about what's called nipple confusion. I've heard a lot about nipple confusion. When can I start feeding my baby with a bottle or give her a pacifier? Most of the time what we recommend is to avoid the use of a pacifier or a bottle until breastfeeding is well established. In most cases, parents can safely wait about two weeks before introducing a bottle with express breast milk or using a pacifier. That's the general recommendation. Um, but again, this is very individualized. Um, it sort of depends on your preference um, and sort of what you have to sort of work with your child and, and learn about your child and what you think um, is best for him or her. And the other thing I just wanted to mention is that for those mothers who um, know that they want to continue to breastfeed, even during times when they may be separated from their infant, for instance, if, if they are planning to go back to work and they want to maintain lactation with using a breast pump, it's usually best to try to start working with the infant doing both breastfeeding and using a bottle. Um, don't wait until the day before you're going to go back to work is what I would recommend. The next question that is commonly asked is, what should I do if my baby is in the NICU but I still plan to breastfeed? We kind of touched on it earlier, how well the uh, level three neonatal intensive care unit rooms are are designed in order to make this possible for you with refrigerators and lactation available there. We have breast pumps and refrigerators. 
and uh, in every private room. And we have lactation consultants ready to available to assist you in this process. In addition, we have a program to monitor babies who might need donor breast milk in the event that they meet the necessary criteria. One final question um, that we have sort of put together is a question about whether or not um, a woman can get pregnant if she's still breastfeeding, and the answer is yes. Relying on breastfeeding to suppress your ovulation is effective only for women who exclusively breastfeed. It may not suppress the ovulation beyond six months after delivery, and it also uh, will not suppress ovulation for women who've already had their period. Having said that, if you are not sure whether you meet the recommended criteria to use breastfeeding as your birth control, we really recommend that you talk to your doctor about your individualized situation. All right, so we are receiving some good questions online. Um, so we're going to try to start now addressing some of the questions that we have received from patients. There's a question on here from a patient who wants to know what she should bring with her when she comes to the hospital for her delivery. Um, I think we already talked about the fact that if you um, are planning to breastfeed and you have a breast pump, you can bring that with you, bring your supplies. We also, like we said, have those available at the hospital for purchase. Um, if you're planning to nurse, you may want to um, go ahead and get um, the nursing tops, nursing bras, et cetera, bring those with you because obviously you'll, you'll be using those. And one thing we do also want to remind everyone is that you need to bring your car seat with you because you will need that to take home your baby. I'm seeing a question here. Can my infant overeat? In general, the answer is no. Every baby has a slightly different appetite depending on how much fluid they've lost in the hospital and, and how voracious an eater they are, how awake and alert they are versus how sleepy they are. However, infants actually have a pretty good barometer for when they are full. So I would not be worried if your infant seems to want to eat all the time. The only thing I might worry about if your infant wants to eat all the time is are they getting enough? So. Checking with your pediatrician and getting a weight check and those kinds of things that we mentioned earlier are, are still probably the best thing to rely on, but overall, you shouldn't worry about overfeeding your baby. There's another question we received um, about patients who have had reconstructive breast surgery um, who still may be interested in breastfeeding and whether or not that's, that's possible. It depends in part on what type of surgery you've had and how invasive it was in terms of the, the nipple area and the, the duct supply, et cetera. So it's, it's kind of um, individualized for the patient. Um, but in general, if you've had breast surgery, particularly if you've had um, what we call a breast reduction, it is possible that that will make it somewhat more difficult for you to breastfeed. But again, it's very individualized. We had another question um, about, um, you know, we've talked a lot about getting started with the breastfeeding process, but then a lot of parents want to know, well, so how long should I breastfeed and how do I stop breastfeeding? Um, basically, the recommendation is exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of the infant's life. Um, around that time, a, a lot of parents choose to introduce solids to the baby's diet. Um, so you can certainly continue the breastfeeding after that. Um, but a lot of the studies that, that we've done look at the benefits of breastfeeding are for the first six months of life, and so in general that is the recommendation. Uh, and then when I'm talking to, to um, parents about weaning the infant, um, usually in general um, what will happen is you, you drop a feeding or you, um, you, know, you increase the supplementation that you're doing. A lot of times that's um, enhanced because you've already introduced maybe some solids to the, to the baby's diet. Um, 
Here's a question here. Should I breastfeed if I get sick? Uh, this is a really commonly asked question, and the answer is yes, you should continue to breastfeed if you get sick. You will not transfer diseases to your baby through your breast milk unless you are HIV positive, and even that's a very low risk. However, in the United States, we do recommend if you are HIV positive that you not breastfeed your baby. However, if you have a minor cold, gastric illness, anything like that, you should continue to breastfeed your baby because you are making valuable antibodies that your baby will benefit from and hopefully not get the same cold or viral infection that you are suffering from. There's another question we've received about um, whether or not you should keep taking your prenatal vitamin. Um, and this, I'm really glad that someone brought this up. So yes, we do want to remind women who are breastfeeding that you should continue to take your prenatal vitamins, um, particularly for the benefit of the calcium component, because um, obviously that's very important for your milk production. So yes, do continue taking your prenatal vitamins after um, or while you're breastfeeding. And in general, on that same subject, you know, people often say, should I change my diet while I'm breastfeeding? And I say, do not change your diet right off the bat to try and avoid fussiness or this or that. Um, Babies can become fussy with certain foods and certain things that make them produce a lot of gas. However, I don't want mothers eating a very slimmed variety of foods just to accommodate the baby. The mother, to stay healthy and to keep a, you know, a wide variety of nutrition for her, should eat a wide variety of foods. And as Dr. Tamel mentioned, uh, continue your prenatal vitamin. There's another question about um, how to help with breast pain. Um, and I just want to clarify this because someone has asked whether or not uh, cool water should be used to alleviate breast discomfort. And so let me just clarify this. Um, we had talked about using a warm shower or a warm compress to help to alleviate pain from breast engorgement. And oftentimes what that um, produces is a letdown, and so some of the milk will um, come out from the breast and alleviate um, some of the pain from the engorgement. Um, and then another strategy that people may use is after an, a nursing session when the breast is no longer engorged, using a cold compress um, to alleviate some of the breast pain or nipple pain that you may have after a nursing session. And then just as a reminder, there are over-the-counter ointments that are available to sort of help with um, dryness or cracking of your nipples. You don't have to wipe that off before you nurse the, the infant and it's safe to use in breastfeeding. Something that's a little bit tangential to this is a question that came in that said, what is mastitis? Mastitis can come from long-lasting breast engorgement. And so mastitis itself is an inflammatory reaction or infection of the breast, and it can come around because of a couple reasons. Mastitis can be from long-sitting static milk in the breasts and introduction of bacteria from the infant's mouth onto the breast. It can also happen because the ducts in the breast become plugged. And in general, when you feel like you have the flu, postpartum, and you're breastfeeding, you want to make sure your breasts do not have mastitis. And probably, if you think that you do, you should contact your physician and talk to him or her about what you should do. Can cloth diapers be used in the hospital? I don't know. In the hospital, <laughs> in all likelihood, we will not use cloth diapers. We will probably use disposable diapers. However, I'm really not opposed to cloth diapers in any way. And if you wanted to be responsible for changing every diaper of your baby while they're here, and you were very responsible about keeping up with every void and every stool, I'm pretty sure the nurses would actually probably appreciate it. There is another question about um, continuing to breastfeed after your infant has started teething. Um, someone wants to know what are some of the early signs to look for to remove the, the baby from the breast. Um, and this is a good question um, because 
even at the beginning, um, when you're talking about removing the baby from the breast, you want to try to do it in a manner that will minimize um, discomfort for you. One of the ways you can um, detach the infant from the breast is to just gently insert a finger um, next to the baby, baby's mouth um, and take the baby off the breast that way. Um, it, it's possible that sometimes um, if an infant is, is biting you, it may be a sign that that infant is full and is sort of um, done with the nursing uh, session um, and that maybe it may be time to sort of gently um, take the, the baby off the breast. Here's an interesting question, or statement rather, that says, I've heard that formula is now practically like breast milk. Is this true or not? Formula is very good, but nothing actually substitutes for breast milk. Nobody has figured out an exact way to replace the exact lipid structure in formula the same as breast milk, and no one has figured out, to my knowledge, how to put live antibodies into formula so that they can provide that uh, crucial protection during the newborn period. Formula is a great way to feed your baby if you cannot breastfeed or you just don't want to. I don't ever want to give the impression that a mother should feel bad because they don't want to breastfeed. I do, however, think that probably we will have to work a lot harder to completely replicate breast milk. A really common question that I get a lot from patients and I'm seeing here is when should my first appointment with the pediatrician be? Normally the first appointment after you leave the hospital should be within the first week to check for feeding issues, jaundice, and to get a weight check. However, the pediatrician that visits you daily while you're in the hospital will be the one to make that final recommendation about when you should come back. For some infants it's sooner if they're struggling with jaundice or not feeding well. We might not think it constitutes a stay in the hospital, but we might want to see you the next day. Infants of mothers that, you know, have had multiple children and, and are very comfortable navigating the newborn period may not need to come back until their formal one to two week checkup. Um, there's a question about um, a, a patient or, or someone who's watching this presentation who wants to, to be able to go back and, and review it later. And we just want to remind everyone that this is going to be archived on the hospital website if you'd like to. Um, go back and have a chance to re review this again because there is a lot of information on here. Um, someone had asked a question about um, the practice of doing what we call pump and dump. Um, and um, it, it basically asking when should I, when should I pump and dump? Um, and this may um, pertain to, to those um, women who are breastfeeding but um, maybe have had a, a glass of wine with dinner and, and maybe don't want that to be transferred on to the infant. Um, in general, what I will say is the amount of alcohol that is in breast milk is um, basically corresponds to your blood alcohol level. So um, I think you have to sort of reach a... a level of comfort with what you think that might be um, and your decision to pump and dump. Um, the other thing uh, sort of t tangential to this um, is that one thing you might want to try to also learn about before you um, have you have the baby and are breast pumping is what um, are the sort of recommendations about storing breast milk in the refrigerator and how long um, it's safe to freeze breast milk, et cetera, because um, there are rules for that. Um, These rules are um, easily given to you by your pediatrician and are usually in, in a newborn manual of some kind for referencing. However, a very quick rule of thumb is that breast milk freshly pumped is actually good in the room for seven hours and so you don't have to refrigerate it if it's only been sitting there in room air in your household because of the white blood cells and the antibodies that are in it it does not have to be immediately refrigerated however if you know you don't need it at that moment put it away in the fridge and tuck it away it can stay good for four to seven days in a freezer that is not a deep freeze but a side-by-side -side freezer or a freezer that is not opened frequently it can stay good for three months and in a deep freeze that is not open frequently and remains very cold for a long time, breast milk 
can remain good for six months to a year. And uh, so those are the general those are the general rules on that. However, you know those are easily located if you're not able to uh, remember that. So here is an interesting statement. My friend said she mixed formula with her breast milk because formula has more nutrients. Is that true? Does mixing the formula with breast milk cancel out the benefits of breast milk at all? Mixing breast milk and formula is not a huge no-no. It's just generally not done. Um, it doesn't matter if you mix it. However, I would probably finish off the breast milk in the bottle and then just put a formula bottle after it to top the baby off. Uh, breast milk and formula have very similar nutrient quality at the very end of the day, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Breast milk is what's called highly, highly bioavailable. All of the nutrients in breast milk are almost all completely absorbed by your baby because they are a biological substance. So while formula may say on the bottle that it has more milligrams of this or more micrograms of that, it's generally because in order to achieve an absorbable level through a synthetic product, they have to increase the amount of that particular synthetic product in order to achieve the type of the amount that you would get breastfeeding. Vitamin D is a perfect example of that. But, uh, breast milk does not have an extraordinary amount of vitamin D. Iron as well. However, the vitamin D and iron that it does have is very bioavailable and is absorbed in very high quantities as opposed to uh, the bioavailability of these nutrients in formula. Overall, the uh, pediatric endocrinologists these days are recommending vitamin D supplementation to breastfed, implant, in, breastfed infants uh, to make sure that they're getting plenty of vitamin D. But they are also recommending vitamin D to formula-fed infants as well. So this is just proof that, that breast milk and formula are actually very similar at the end of the day in terms of their nutrients and benefit to your baby. Another question we've received is about the use of um, nursing pads. Um, and this is a good point because this, again, might be something that you uh, want to bring to the hospital with you. Um, so there are um, disposable nursing pads. There are also reusable nursing pads that you can wash and, and use multiple times. Um, and there are some that um, aren't as, uh, as absorptive as others. And the basic idea behind this is that you don't want um, the breast to the skin to be moist between your nursing sessions. Um, because it can promote the development of yeast on the skin. Um, whether or not you want to use something that's disposable for your convenience or you find that you're, um, you prefer to use those that are um, reusable, it is really a very personal preference. Um, some people start using one type and then decide to, to use something different. Um, but it's a good idea to at least have something on hand um, so it's not something that you're trying to, to take uh, or to find after you've uh, gone home from your delivery and certainly have, have your hands um, full. A really common question that I get as a pediatrician in the hospital is, I have this newborn here, should I vaccinate him immediately with hepatitis B? The answer is yes. Hepatitis B vaccine is very safe to get at delivery. Many parents are turned off by the idea of giving a vaccine immediately after delivery or in that first two to three day period, really. Hepatitis B is a horribly debilitating liver illness that, if at all avoidable, should be avoided. One of the ways to avoid it is a vaccine at birth that is very protective against hepatitis B. Most mothers are tested in the hospital to say whether they have hepatitis B or not. However, you should know that no laboratory study is completely perfect or without flaw. And if you have a particularly high-risk lifestyle, you might be negative on your test and actually positive. Even myself in healthcare, with a potential of a needle stick or anybody working in the hospital or anybody at risk in any way, should consider giving the hepatitis B at birth in order to prevent a disaster later that might have been preventable. We have another question um, about a listener who is experiencing some nipple discharge um, in pregnancy. She says she's about eight months along and she wants to know if this is okay, is this normal? Um, and the short answer is that um, yes. It sort of depends on uh, the type of, of um, discharge that you're seeing, but 
basically you may in your pregnancy see um, what appears to be a milk. You may be able to express some milk from your breast um, during your pregnancy and in general this is normal. Um, but what I will say is if you're ever concerned whether you're pregnant or not about nipple discharge, please go see your physician, okay? Here's a question. How will I know if a particular medicine that I want to take is safe for breastfeeding? Very good question. In general, most things that you put in your mouth will in some large or minute amount make it into your breast milk. However, most medicines do not become highly available in the breast milk at levels that will hurt your baby. To be extraordinarily cautious, pediatricians have yearly updated textbooks on which medicines are in fact safe for breastfeeding. So if you do have a question about a particular medicine you want to take, the thing you need to do is just call your pediatrician and the doctors and nurses will reference these textbooks and give you the most updated information on whether or not you can take that while you breastfeed. In general, ibuprofen, Tylenol, these kinds of things for pain relief are completely safe for breastfeeding and you don't need to worry about it. Two particularly common medicines that people ask me about all the time are cough and cold remedies and histamines and decongestants. I generally recommend not taking these because they will decrease your milk supply or can potentially decrease your milk supply. And on top of that, there have been a couple instances where they did affect the newborn. It's best to just ride your cold out and uh, not worry too much about it. We're going to scan through some of these questions here and make sure that we have answered all of them. Um, there's another question here about continuing to take uh, prenatal vitamins while breastfeeding. Um, and um, this um, question in particular is how long should I continue to take the prenatal vitamins um, while I'm breastfeeding? And the answer um, is to just as long as you're breastfeeding, continue to take your prenatal vitamin. Um, again, um, it's important to get that calcium supplementation. Okay. Here is an interesting question that says, what are some foods we need to avoid or ignore to prevent my baby from getting sick? That is a very good question. It, during pregnancy, that is actually much more pertinent than during breastfeeding. Listeria is a very common illness um, in some countries that don't pasteurize a lot of their products. In the United States, it is very difficult to get listeria from an unpasteurized product. However, a lot of people drink raw milk, a lot of people eat a ton of lunch meat, and other uh, uh, prepared, shall we say, but not completely cooked foods. So, you know, be very careful in lunch deli lines when you're pregnant. Be very careful not to eat places that you haven't established a trust with. You should stay away from sushi. However, when you're breastfeeding, you can eat these products with a little more you know, confidence that it won't hurt you or your newborn. I still think it would be kind of miserable in the newborn period to have an illness like this, even if you're just trying to take care of your baby and would certainly affect your milk supply if you got listeria or some sushi-borne illness while you're breastfeeding. So probably the best thing to do is get your milk supply established, eating normal cooked foods that are pasteurized, and then toward the end of the uh, breastfeeding period that you, you know, you want to do, you know, you can experiment with some other foods. We're going to take one last look here and make sure that we have answered all the questions. And I think that we may have covered them. Oh, there's a question about caffeine. Uh, caffeine is generally safe during pregnancy and breastfeeding. You know, if you're used to drinking a cup of coffee a day, you can continue to drink your cup of coffee a day while you're pregnant and while you're breastfeeding. Yes, so during um, pregnancy, um, what we really have to recommend to, to patients who are pregnant is that they try to limit their caffeine intake. Um, usually one to two cups of, of uh, coffee, for instance, is safe to, um, to consume during pregnancy. Um, 
we generally recommend that you try to, to limit it to, to that, um, certainly during pregnancy. And there is a certain amount of, of caffeine that does transfer um, in breast milk. So there's something to, to be mindful. Um, whatever coffee you're drinking, uh, your breastfed baby is also drinking. So just a little reminder. <laughs> no five-hour energies or monster no. sodas should be consumed at this time. Yes. Here's a really good question that I get all the time. So <clears throat> very high-yield subject. When is it okay to take the newborn out of the house? Newborns themselves are really not that fragile. It's that people around them may contain illnesses that we don't want your baby to get. Pertussis is a perfect example. We begin to vaccinate for pertussis at two months of age. When you take your baby out of the house, take your baby into a well-aerated area during times of the day that aren't that hot. If you want to eat out at a restaurant, go eat at 11. Don't eat at lunch hour and be crammed in the corner next to the coughing person. If you want to take your baby to the mall or go to the grocery store, do, again, do it during low-yield times. You know, it, it, there's only a certain amount of stress that a mother can endure before it becomes completely unenjoyable to leave the house. You missed a feeding, you have to pump, you're engorged. So I kind of recommend people stay put for a while just for their own safety and just for their own enjoyment of the newborn period. However, it is safe to leave. I do recommend on the subject of pertussis, it is very important, can't stress this enough, very important for the net of protection to be solidified around your infant before delivery if possible, but after delivery is also acceptable. Flu vaccines and tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis vaccination should be given to anybody within that close net so that before your baby can get his or her vaccinations for that, they have a least likely chance to uh, get that particular illness. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Tamel and Dr. Brack, for your time today. We really appreciate you sharing your insight with us. Thanks to all the attendees who uh, asked such interesting questions and participated in today's conversation. Uh, we hope that the information today has been helpful to you, but please be advised that this discussion is not a substitute for, nor does it constitute medical advice or medical care. If you have any concerns about you or your baby's health, please consult your physician. You can find an archive of this presentation online at http colon slash slash womens.memorialherman.org.